So the other day I needed to create a nylon webbing material and it turns out it was a little bit trickier than I thought. My first attempt of using real cloth didn't quite pan out the way I wanted it to. And eventually after reworking it, I ended up with something that looks like this. And I think this looks pretty cool. We've got some different colors. It's easy to customize. I can control how shiny it looks, things like that. So with today's tutorial, I'm gonna show you how I made this material and how you can save it to your library and customize it so you can reuse it any way you need to. So without further ado, let's dive in. Before we begin, I'm gonna move the side of my key shot window over so I can look at this reference image of nylon webbing, which is the material we're gonna make. I also wanna hide the library panel because we really don't need that. And next I wanna import the model. I will make this model available to you for free. You can get it from my file vault. I will link that up down below. Just take the default import settings. If you get an error, don't worry about it, ignore it. It has to do with a texture that it can't find. So here's our mesh. We're gonna go ahead and double click on it and open the material graph. Now, when I tried to create this using real cloth earlier on, I didn't get the best results for a number of reasons. I won't get into that, but we're gonna use a different approach here. I wanna delete this texture map and start by changing from generic material type down to a plastic. Next, we're gonna need a few nodes. So I'll right click, go down to displace. We know we're gonna need one of those and we're going to grab a mesh as well as a brushed. Now we'll need a few other nodes, but we'll figure those out as we go. Let's take our mesh and plug it into the diffuse socket on the plastic node. Now the first thing I wanna do with this mesh is actually change it to a UV mapping type. This is gonna allow the texture to flow across the surface of this model. And the reason it's working is because uh, I made sure to UV unwrap this. I did model this in Blender. I thought it would be an easier approach than trying to create a soft fabric-like material using pad. So next we want to go and adjust the circles to look more like the shapes we see on this reference photo. We're gonna go down to the section called shape and pattern. If you're lost in the side panel, I don't blame you, there's a lot going on. It's under shape and pattern, and we want to change it from circle to ellipse. So if we go under the shape width and height, we can go ahead and unconstrain them by clicking this blue link. And if we take the shape height and increase it from 0 0.005 to 0 0.01, those circles would be twice as tall as they are wide. Next, we're going to also need to adjust the placement of them. So we're going to go under the mesh pattern and choose custom. And we're going to once again unconstrain by clicking on this blue link, the distance U and V. So when we start playing with these sliders, we should be able to move the circles closer or further apart. If you want, it can be easier to start off with a staggered. So if I click staggered, this will offset them halfway, creating kind of a crisscross pattern. So if you wanna take the most direct path to learning Keyshot, then check out my Keyshot Rendering Masterclass. It's already helped hundreds of others level up, including designers from Nike, Dell, Logitech, Sonos, Garmin, Trek, Pepsi, and lots of others. See, I designed the Keyshot Rendering Masterclass to be the most comprehensive course available while still making it super easy to understand. And what makes it different is the unique combination of bite-sized feature-based videos coupled with follow-along project-based lessons. This course will help you build an intuitive understanding of how Keyshot works. Then you'll be able to create and explore within Keyshot without getting bogged down by the technical aspects of the software. My goal is to help you convert your ideas to digital images. When you enroll, you'll get access to over 100 video lessons, quizzes, an active comments section, private Discord server channel, and project files to maximize your learning. So check out the link in the description below to learn more. I hope to see you there. Now, if we go back down to custom, we can fine tune their positioning. So what I wanna do is bring them a little closer together, especially left to right. So I'll take that distance V down a little bit and then the distance U, and I'm just moving them closer together till they're almost touching. That's about what we want. The next thing I wanna point out is that the circles themselves are pretty hard. They have a hard edge. So if I increase this thing called fall off above the shape width and height, it will soften the shape of them. Uh, we're gonna bring this up to 0.8. And since this is a little confusing, I wanna go and change the color. So the color is set to white and the background color is set to black. And now 
This is a little bit easier to see. And we can continue playing with the scale of this. So if I use the scale mesh, this big wheel, this will take the entire pattern and make it smaller. Now I don't actually need it to be smaller. In this case, I think actually we probably need to go a little bit bigger to get closer to that reference image. And what we wanna do is play with the spacing. So we'll take the distance U and V and I can lock that aspect. And if I drag to the left, we can bring those closer together without making the individual ellipses any smaller. So we're just trying to create this sort of mesh pattern that we have here on the left. And we're looking pretty good. Maybe we can bring them a little closer together left to right. Now underneath that, there's a variation section. If you wanna add a little bit of organic variation, jitter will change the position or the placement of those ellipses. Distortion will actually change the shape of them. I like to do like 0 0.05 maybe for each of these, which will just give us a very small amount of randomness, which will help. The next thing we want to do is take a look at our brushed pattern. So if I hit C to preview the brushed, uh, what we will get is something that looks like a gradient. We need to also change the mapping type of this to UV and we need to scale it way down. I can go ahead and switch it to scene units and go down to one, try 0.1. And then what we want to do is take the length and make it longer. Let's try five. Maybe we can go a little shorter than that, maybe like three. And what I wanna do is take the grain down to zero, grain size down to zero. And we just want a very simple set of fibers here. Probably gonna make them even smaller yet. Let's try half of this value, so 0 0.05. What I'm gonna do is hit C to get out of that preview. And we're going to use a color composite. I'm gonna go down to uh, utilities and color composite. We're gonna plug the mesh into the source and the brushed into the background. And when we hit C to preview the color composite, we can change how these two textures interact by changing the blend mode. And in this case, I want to do overlay. Now something is definitely going a little weird here. Let's look into that mesh, double click on it. Because we have it plugged in this color composite, looks like we have options now for alpha mode. We just wanna set this to opaque and it will not create that weird artifact that you were seeing there earlier. Now, the next thing I wanna do is actually a little counterintuitive, but we're gonna go into this mesh and change the background color to be 50% gray, not pure black and white. And it's gonna make the contrast between these black and white values a little bit lower. Okay, so next I wanna take my mesh, plug it into the displace node, plug the displace node into the geometry socket. Double click on displace, and we need to make this very small. I'm not used to working in centimeters, so I'm gonna quickly change the scene units uh, uh, over on edit scene units go down a millimeter, and I wanna keep the scene the same size, so I'll hit okay. I'm gonna start with a displacement height of 0.5 millimeter. I always like to start small with that value, and we'll go ahead and execute the geometry node and see what happens. Hopefully you can tell it's pushed out the geometry in every direction. When I disconnect the mesh from the diffuse, you can see our mesh has been displaced, but it's pretty ugly. If you look really close, we get all sorts of weird shadows and shapes. A couple things here. First off, I'm gonna take my plastic and change the color to something dark so we can see it. And I need to change my lighting setup because right now we're getting really no highlights or shadows anywhere. So if I close out the material graph briefly, and then I hit M to bring back that materials library and go into the environments, I'm gonna use something uh, with a little more contrast maybe. I think I'll use this HDR map Cyclorama Studio, which is just like a, a photo studio. I'm gonna hold control, left click and drag to rotate that HDRI until I have light reflecting on the surface of the model. That way I can keep track of what our uh, materials looking like a little more accurately. I'll go ahead and close that library again. And I'll hit C on the keyboard to put up a white background for now. If you wanna change that white background, it's under environment, under settings background, and we can choose something like a light gray for now instead of pure white. After that, we can hop back into that material graph. So to fix this bad displacement, what I recommend we do is take the triangle size down and make it small. So I can try 0.1 millimeters, and when I hit refresh, they'll get smoother looking. We're also going to see that every time we do this, we increase the number of triangles in our scene. Not the end of the world, but just something to be aware of. For now, we're gonna leave it at 0.1 millimeters. It's looking pretty good, although it's pushing out really far. In fact, I think a little too much. So I'm gonna bring this 0.5 value down to 0.3 and give that a shot and see if it looks a little more natural. I think that's looking better for the most part. I'm still thinking that the shape of my mesh needs some work. I need to make these ellipses a little bit taller and get them a little closer together. 
So this can be a little tough to do, so we can disable the displacement, plug this right back on into the plastic and refresh the geometry node. And now I can work on this mesh pattern a little more easily. So I'm gonna unconstrain or turn off the lock aspect and make the shape height a little bit taller. So I'm gonna try 0 0.015. I think that's looking pretty good. I think with that, we're also going to need to take the mesh pattern spacing and stretch it out a little bit. So I'm gonna to go to the distance V and make that a little bit bigger. So 0 0.009, create a little bit more space in there, hopefully. Let's go a little higher, 0 0.01. Enable the displace node and we'll disable or disconnect the mesh into the plastic and refresh. So that should be looking a little bit better. We have our overall shape. Now, one thing I'll mention, if you're still getting some artifacts in here that you don't like on this mesh, you may find that you get better results by going into the displace and even making the triangle size smaller. So 0 0.05 is what I'm gonna do. We can take our max triangles up higher if we need to to about 10 and I can hit execute again. Basically, I'm looking to increase this detail until I don't see any weird artifacts in that surface. And since we're not gonna be that close to it, I think this is looking pretty good here. Okay, so before we use our color composite here, let's take our brush and plug it right on into the bump of the plastic. Now, this brush texture is really small. If I hit C to preview, you can see these individual strands are, are teeny tiny. When you scale a texture down so small, you need to increase the bump height significantly in order to be able to see it. So double click on that brush and we see the bump height is set to five. I can type in 10, which may seem high, and we're not even gonna see much of a result. What if I go to 100? Still not seeing that much of a result. Let's try 1,000. There we go. So when's the last time you needed to take the bump height up to 1,000? I don't know, but when you have a texture scaled down so small, that's what it's gonna take. What I'm looking for is these individual streaks to kind of capture some of that light and make it look like there's individual threads in there. That's really gonna help. Um, and to be honest, we could probably even go higher than 1,000. We can try maybe 1,500 just to push that a little bit further. But overall, I think that's looking good. Next, I wanna take my mesh and plug it into the diffuse of my plastic, and let's work on the color here. If I right click on this connector, go to Utilities, Color Adjust, we can easily go to the Colorize value and choose the color that we want for our mesh. So you could use a bunch of bright colors like I had on the thumbnail of this video, or you can go with something pretty traditional and just use a black, which I think I'm gonna do for this tutorial because a black nylon is a very common material that we've all seen. We know what it should look like. I'm gonna bring it down pretty dark, maybe 12%. Well, I'll go down to 10. I'll go ahead and hit okay. So what's cool is anytime you wanna change the color of this, just go into your colorize and pick whatever color you want for the mesh. And it's an easy way to turn this into like a multi-material where you can have all different colors of this material. Right there, you could probably call it good, but we've got a few issues. It's the same amount of roughness or glossiness all over, which isn't quite giving us the effect we want. So we need to deal with some roughness and some specular values really quickly. We're gonna do that with our color composite. The first thing I wanna do is plug this into, it doesn't really matter which one first, let's do specular first. If you're not used to or familiar with specular, the way it works is uh, by default, the specular value was white, so it reflected all the light that hit it, uh, this material, evenly. And what we're gonna do is use a color to number, right click on that connector going between our color composite and specular, go to utilities, color to number, and we're gonna preview that with C. So what we're gonna do here is adjust these values so that the white areas are gonna be the most reflective and the black areas are gonna be the least reflective. We wanna emphasize these individual ellipses or bumps that we have in here to make them look a little more shiny, which is what happens with nylon. Now in the real world, that's anisotropy. We can't fully control that here in this material type, but we can get pretty darn close. So let's go ahead into this color to number and take the input from and increase it. This is gonna take those dark pixel values, those black values, and it's going to make them even darker. The reason we're doing this is because it's gonna separate those bumps that we want and make those look a little bit shinier than the others, or more reflective, I should say. So we get out of this preview, we should notice now that not a lot of light is reflecting between these bumps, but more light is reflecting off of the surface of those bumps. And that looks pretty good, but we can get a little bit more control here. So what we want to do is preview that once again, and we don't want it to be quite as high contrast as it is here. We also want the parts 
on those bumps to be even uh, more effective. So we can take this value of one and we can go a little higher, maybe 1.25, just to emphasize that. And if we take the output from, we can take those black values and make them more gray, which means they will reflect a little bit more light. So if I get out of this preview and we increase this output from, the areas between those bumps are gonna become a little more reflective. And the reason we want some reflectivity in there is because we don't want this to look unnatural. So it's just about striking that balance between what looks good and what looks more natural. I think I'm gonna take the input from value, bring that down a little bit, and I think right there, that's gonna be good. We're gonna repeat this process for the roughness, but we're gonna do some different adjustments for that. So if I grab my color composite and plug it into the plastic and go into roughness, we notice this whole thing goes dark. We're gonna fix that by inserting another color to number on that connector. Utilities, color to number, and preview. When we look at the white pixels here, the way Keyshot interprets them is that for roughness, the lighter the color, the more rough it's gonna be because white is equal to 100%, right? So if we take this and invert it, then the bumps will be a little bit glossier or shinier and we're going to have a rougher area in between these bumps, which is exactly what we're looking for. This will further emphasize these bumps or threads that are sticking off the surface. So to invert this, we just swap the output from and the output to values of our color to number. So we'll type in one and then tab and then zero and enter. And what you've done is basically inverted that. And again, those blacker areas, those black pixels will be glossier. So if we get out of this preview with C, we should notice that we get little glossy reflections, little specular glossy reflections on those bumps, which is good. We wanna make sure they're just not too extreme. So if we get back into that color to number, I want to make some adjustments so we don't have pure black and pure white. So we're gonna take the input two, which is the one that's gonna represent those black values because we inverted this. So if we drag that down, you're gonna get a little bit darker. We're gonna use this to kind of emphasize those bumps, take the input from and increase this a little bit. So now we have more separation between those white and black values. And now we use the output from and output to to adjust how black and how white these pixels look. Black is represented by zero, so I should be able to increase this and make those black values, which are purely glossy, make them a little less pure glossy, and then take those white values, which are represented by one, and make them a little bit more gray, so they're a little bit more glossy. So by doing this, we're basically trying to find that balance, like I said, where this still looks fairly realistic, but not overly emphasized on those little bumps. And this is really gonna just come down to taste as well as the color of your material. If we were to go and make this a light color, like yellow, you're gonna notice that this looks pretty odd. We're gonna have to go in and make some adjustments to make this look more natural as a yellow material. And because yellow is also a very bright color, you're going to need to emphasize the glossy reflections on these little bumps as well. So if you're working with a bright color like this, the way I would recommend you do this is take your contrast down a lot and it's going to take those dark areas between each of those bumps and it's going to make them lighter. So you can play with this to try to make it look like more like a natural looking uh, material. And then depending on your values for your roughness and specular, you can dial those in to make this look a little bit more soft or like high contrast to make it look a little bit more shiny. So while you can use similar values, for these different materials, depending on the color that you're rendering this material as, you are gonna want to play with some slightly different values in each of these color to numbers. And that's what I found. I had to use slightly different values in here to really dial in the colors, whether it was black or red or green or whatever. But the good news is this is a good safe base starting point and you can use this. You could save this to your library and use this anytime you need a nylon fabric material and then go in and start making some adjustments. If you wanted to know what I did for these individual parts down in here that are representing these stitches, it's pretty much the same. I'm gonna take this brushed, I'm gonna hit Control C to copy this brushed node and we're gonna go right on into here, go into the material graph. So I just double clicked on one of those threads We'll change this from generic down to plastic, just like we did with the other ones. And in this case, I'll just set it to a black as well. I want to link it, so shift left click, shift right click, all these others, so they're linked. So for these guys, if I right click and do paste, should have that brush node. We're gonna plug that right on into bump like we did with the other one. Looks like it's going the wrong way. So we're gonna type in angle UV, we'll type in 90 to go left to right. 
And that's pretty much all I would do there. If you want, you could also plug it into like a, like a roughness or something like that if you need to. Um, we'll go to roughness. You could insert a little color to number and this would allow you to, if you preview it, control how shiny things look. So basically if we take this and darken the whole thing up quite a bit, it's going to look a lot more reflective. So there you go. That's how I make nylon webbing in KeyShot. And until next time, happy rendering.